Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean. We are on location in Santa Clara, California at a hot rod shop and we got a cool project for you. A guy we met recently, this guy Mikey, is doing a V8 swap on his third gen 4Runner. So we're gonna try to capture as much of this job as possible depending on what days they end up doing different things uh, at the shop. So when we're available, we're gonna be here filming this job. The first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna remove the whole body off the frame. So they're gonna take the bumpers off, then they're gonna just start disconnecting everything so they can raise the whole body off the chassis and then work on getting the engine out and the new engine back in. So they're gonna have to fabricate some custom motor mounts in order for that V8 to bolt up to the frame. And this is gonna be a cool project and we hope we're gonna be able to show you most of it. Uh, so here we go. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the front bumper off. So Daniel here is working on Mikey's truck right now. So he just took off two bolts that hold the bottom part of this plastic trim to this piece of the frame. So there's two bolts right here that he took off. Daniel right now is working on a mount in the fender well. The tire kind of gets in your way, but there's a hole right here that you can get a socket in and remove this nut right here. And then this will disconnect the fender from this part on both sides. You have the same type of mount on both sides. So you got to take that nut off. It looks like it's a 14 millimeter. To get the bumper free, he's going to have to disconnect the light connections on the passenger and driver side. And then there's two bolts that he's going to have to take off there on each side, one here and one here. And then that should be it. And he'll be able to pull the bumper free. So Daniel just decided to take the two bolts off of each end here to remove the bumper as opposed to taking these two loose. So whatever floats your boat gets the job done the same way. Next thing Daniel's doing is he's going to remove the skid plates and get those out of the way. Since they have a lift available, we're going to lift it up to make taking things off easier. Now with it on the lift, it's going to be a lot easier to get the rest of the skid plates out of the way and do some other work. Now we're draining the radiator and we're removing the spare tire. While the radiator's draining, we're behind the driver's seat, lifted up the passenger seat, and we're gonna disconnect these connectors. One is definitely for the fuel pump. The other one maybe is the fuel level gauge, but I'm not 100% sure what this other one is, but this one is the, for the fuel pump. So we gotta disconnect these because when we pull the body up off the frame, these will rip out. So we wanna disconnect them. Got the air box out of the way. That was just three bolts, pretty easy. And disconnected this, the connection right here for the harness that goes through the firewall. So he got the glove box out of the way and he's gonna start disconnecting all the stuff for the harness. We'll unplug this connector here and then we'll unplug these three from the computer and then that whole harness should fish through the firewall. Pulling those plugs out. Now he's going to feed it through the firewall. So now none of the electrical harness will be holding up, removing the body off the frame. Yeah, pull that out as I push it through. So one's pulling it out from the engine side while he's feeding it through on the cab side. So here's the whole harness pulled out. Just removing other connectors on the back, anything that's holding pieces from the engine to the body. It's gonna be hard to show up to, he's disconnecting the hoses that hook up to the heater core. So the heater core is, you know, what gives your cab heat. So he's disconnecting those lines back there. Disconnected this connector from the fuse box. This goes to the positive battery cable harness to power the fuses. So he's disconnecting that. Disconnecting this other cable connects to the positive battery cable. So he's gonna disconnect this harness from the body so this power cable could be free. So just a small 10 millimeter nut. Now that harness is free from the body at that point. There's a couple breather hose connections that just attach to the fender well down there. And so you have to just take them out of their clip, the two breather hoses, one for the differential. I think the other one, what is the other one for? Is it the transfer case or? I don't know what the other one's for. 
Or is it both for the differential? I think they're, they're both for the diff. One was for the center, one for, was for one side. Oh, okay. Yeah, so both of those breather tubes, they just snap into a plastic clip on the fender and just pull those out. They're both for the front differential breathers. Disconnecting the upper radiator hose from the engine. Now he's gonna take the fan off, so he's breaking the 14 millimeter nuts loose. He's using a pry bar to hold it because it's slipping a little bit. The nuts are tight, and as he tries to turn it, the pulley's slipping on him. He's disconnecting the AC lines from the receiver dryer and from the AC condenser. So you can see where he disconnected the AC line from the condenser, and he's feeding that AC line through the body. And then this was the connection he disconnected from the receiver dryer. So the fan's out of the way now. And since we're swapping motors, he just cut the belts off to get them out of the way so he can remove the fan. And he's disconnecting the overflow tube to the radiator. By the way, before he disconnected these lines, he had a guy come by and evacuate the system for him. He captured the refrigerant. Now he's removing the lower radiator hose. So he's got it off the engine and now he's gonna get it off the radiator itself. Now Daniel's just disconnecting the transmission cooler lines from the transmission cooler on the bottom of the radiator. The send line and the return line. Disconnecting some other things on the driver's side fender, these hose connections. That's a plug, huh? Yeah. Those two hoses are free. That's a fuel one? Uh, yeah, that was probably fuel return, maybe. Took a fuel hose off of there. He's gonna take this flare nut fitting. This looks like another gas line, right? It's gotta be gas, right? Yeah. So it's another gas line. He's using a couple flare nut wrenches that disconnect it from the engine. You got your lines that are attached to the body. So now this fuel line is out of the way. Basically disconnected this one right here from right here. So back here, he disconnected the heater control cable that pulls out of a clip right here. And then this little thing hooks onto the end here. When you turn the heater control knob, it turns this valve. So disconnected that. It's basically popping everything free that's gonna hold up the body coming away from the frame and the engine. So Daniel's now just removing the four 14 millimeter bolts to pull the radiator out. And then Wes just disconnected this throttle cable. The throttle cable attaches to the, the gas pedal, so you gotta disconnect that so the, that could come free of the engine. He's disconnecting the coiled brake line where it comes into that connector. He's gonna disconnect it on both sides. He's also gonna have to disconnect the rag joint right here. He's gonna have to disconnect it just like we show in the body lift and when we do the steering rack, he's gonna disconnect the rag joint so the steering shaft will be free of the steering rack. So we disconnected the fuel filler pipe hose and then we disconnected this bracket right here. It was a 12 millimeter bolt that we removed so that this bracket will be free. Disconnect the transmission shifter. It's a 12 millimeter nut. Just take that free. This center console piece has to come out to disconnect the emergency brake cable. So we took a couple screws out here and here, Phillips said, and then we're gonna get down in here and take out some 10 millimeter bolts that hold the center console in so we can get better access to disconnect the emergency brake cable. So now we got the center console out of the way and we're gonna remove these two small nuts to get the cable free. So we got the emergency brake cable out. It's got these splines you gotta push in. There's a tab here that you can bend out of the way. Once you get the screws loose to take the cable out, you gotta bend that tab out of the way right here so you can feed the cable out and then through the hole right there. This is what those splines look like I was talking about. So you have to compress these splines to pull this out of the body. This is the end of the cable. This is the stud that had the two nuts on it that attached to the e-brake. So when you pull it, it pulls tension on the cable. Now we're just gonna work on getting all the body mounts out. So you got one here. And then if you look at our body lift video, you'll see where they're all at. We disconnected this AC connection. This is the low pressure line that comes from the AC condenser and goes back towards down here, back to the AC compressor. So that's a big fitting 
this fitting right here. So uh, we just used two big crescent wrenches because that's a big flare nut fitting and we didn't have one at the shop. Broke that free. Now this is free so the body can go up when we lift the body off the chassis. We got some type of ground wire grounds the body to the frame here. So we're gonna have to take this ground wire off. And then also this will have to come free because this is attached to the hitch carrier, which is attached to the frame. So in order for the body to come up, we gotta take this little bracket off so we can free the hitch receiver electrical away. So we're getting ready to lift this up. We're gonna lift up the body on the pinch weld. Same thing we showed in the body lift video. So he's just gonna disperse the weight on the pinch weld with these rubber blocks. Looks like it's clearing on this side. The body mounts are coming up. The mud flaps need to come off right there. Something hanging up over there. We're just making sure nothing else is gonna hold us up. We're gonna pull any wires apart or any hose connections, rip anything off. So this is a pretty cool view. <laughs> pretty cool. There was a connection here that went underneath the truck. So we had disconnected here. Finally got everything free. This body's just gonna pull away from the truck. <laughs> Don't see this every day. What's that getting hung up? We're bending the lines. Where were those? They go up into the body. I think those are bent beyond repair. Or? There's no kinks in them. That's good. Yeah, pick tool. They got one here. So if your forerunner had a six foot lift, this was what it looked like. <laughs> Not every day you get a look at a forerunner like this. So body is up, off. Now you get to see what everything looks like with the body out of the way. Kind of a cool thing to see. Gas tank. What the top of the transfer case and transmission look like. Pretty cool. It's gonna mark the areas where the tires are because the lift is gonna keep the body where it's gonna keep the body. That's not gonna change, but as they're working on it, if they roll the chassis on the floor in a different position, they'll know where to put it back. So they're gonna put tape on either side of the wheel on the ground to know where to get the tires back in place. So they're gonna mark all sides, front and rear, and side to side so they'll know where to get the tires exactly so they can drop the body straight down and everything should line up pretty good. You can see that dished out area that Toyota and their infinite wisdom decide to do to make it harder for you to change your shock absorbers. So now we got the front drive shaft out of the way and we got the rear drive shaft out of the way. Here's the cam plug. So these things you really never see unless you have one of those telescoping mirrors. Those are the cam plugs on the backs of your heads that can sometimes leak and that you should replace when you do your valve cover gasket job. So you got one on the back here and one here. And then there's the, where the rear half moon is on the head right there. And then you got the other half moon right there. That's a transmission breather right there. And this is the transfer case breather right here. Yeah, so when we pulled Sean's transmission, we had to disconnect all this wiring crap, get it all off. I never really knew, but this is actually a lift point for the engine. So when we get ready to pull this engine out, that's a lift point right here. And then 
coming around the engine. It looks like we can bolt something up right here, right behind the power steering. It looks like you can bolt up something like a chain right here and then loop a chain up and over to that other one and pick the engine up. Okay, so we disconnected the power steering lines that you see in our steering rack video. And then as you see in our motor mount video, we disconnected the motor mounts. So right in here, either side, we had to disconnect all these power steering line connections to pull the motor out. So there's a bracket right here. There's a bracket right here that was there. And there was a bracket right here. So we disconnected all these. So this will come free because these lines are still attached to the power steering pump. So we basically disconnected the lines from their brackets from the frame and from the steering rack. Now we're getting a chain. So this is a natural lift point on the engine that Toyota puts on the 3.4 liter V6. This is an actual lift bracket right here. And then we're gonna string the chain over to another mount point on the passenger side of the engine. He's gonna hook a chain to this bolt right here in the head and he's just gotta find the right size bolt and the right size pit thread to thread into there. So, so we've got the transmission mount also disconnected too because they're gonna lift this whole thing up as one piece. Transfer case, transmission, and engine in one big unit. We also had to disconnect this electrical harness connection right here that goes to the differential, the ADD system that you saw in our front differential swap, this electrical connection. Here's your breather. There's two breathers that go to the front differential. That's those two that connect up to the driver's side fender well. So we've got it chain bolted across. Okay, moment of truth. Mikey is doing the honors because it's his truck to lift the motor out. I don't know why I'm doing the honors. <laughs> Here we go. Here comes the motor with the tranny and transfer case. It's gonna be a little rear heavy because it's got all that weight in the back. I didn't mention it earlier. He's cut the exhaust here. There it comes. That movement. Right around the frame. It looked like there was one here that you guys got, maybe? Yeah, that might have to come down a little bit. This thing's hooked. Is that enough? More? A little more. There we go. Now that's free. Okay. We think we're clear now. This is a 3.4 liter V6 with the automatic transmission and transfer case and part of the exhaust all attached. There we go. It's rear heavy. Yes. So they got the transfer case resting on a pipe spread between two tall jack stands and they're rolling the chassis out underneath it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. There goes Mikey's truck, part of it. Here's the transfer case transmission and engine suspended. Now we got the pipe out of the way. Bye bye drivetrain. <laughs> what do you think, Mikey? Let's hope this goes back together. <laughs> Now, this is what the chassis looks like with no motor, no transmission, no transfer case, and no body. You get a good view of the uh, front differential for swapping yeah. now. Yeah, this is the front differential that's a pain in the butt to replace. The bolts. Yep. That, that hold on that plate. That uh... Yeah, rear mount. That's the rear mount. That's a disaster. Yep. Your ADD control module, or whatever the hell you want to call it. Breather lines that are a pain in the butt to remove sometimes when you're doing this job <laughs> with the body on. This is the cross member number three where the transmission mount bolts to. Cross member number four, muffler, gas tank. This is where that electrical connection is to the fuel pump is and the other connection we could disconnected. These are all the body mounts that you would mess with if you're putting a body lift on. Right here and right here. Here's the rear body mount. This is where the spare tire comes up in. This is the spare tire mechanism. Pretty cool vantage point seeing this with the body off. That's the rag joint that you disconnect and you have to put a puck in there if you're going to put a body lift. Front sway bar. Pretty cool. Yeah, this is a good view of all the line connections for the fuel system. This is the new sending unit that he's going to put in. So what kind of motor are you putting in? 2UZ out of a 2003 Sequoia. 4.7 V8. Okay. Um, and so we're doing the whole thing, transfer everything out of the Sequoia so that it's 
it's an A340F, same transmission, but apparently the bell housing is different on the V8 uh, transmission. Okay. Uh, and then we're using the Sequoia transfer case. But this is an O2 Forerunner, uh, and the O3 Sequoia, they're very similar with the all wheel drive. It's got the Multimatic, I think it's called. Okay. Um, so it should be somewhat of a drop in. The wiring is actually fairly straightforward. It's harder if you're doing like the earlier Forerunner, like the 98. Uh -huh. uh, you need kind of the electronics for the multibatic work well with the Sequoia. Oh, okay. Right? And so then here, this is the Sequoia fuel pump. You pull that out of the tank. I'm hoping it appears. It looks like it's the same thing, huh? It looks very close. As long as the depth is, is the same, it probably exactly. should bolt up fine, huh? Exactly. And if not, we can pull the actual pump and put it in there. Yeah. But this is going to be carb legal, uh, carb legal swap. So they want to see the Sequoia pump. The carbon box, which is up under here. Carbon box? Yeah, so that's the charcoal canister. This is the Sequoia one that we pulled off. Okay. So that will be going and bolting up there. And so they want okay. to see that it's the Sequoia part. Okay. Uh, and then we can run our own lines, but the wiring, this requires a fuel pump resistor that we pulled off the Sequoia. Uh, other than that, most of the wiring is compatible. So for Mikey, how did you learn all these things you had to do? Forums. <laughs> <laughs> From forums? Of, okay. Yeah. So you learned... Okay. Uh, T4R forum. Okay. Uh, and Lexstream.com. Okay. some more. Uh, and then the Toyota, the tech info. You can get subscription tech info. They have all... Toyota has amazing wiring diagrams for both Sequoia and Forerunner of this generation with pinouts and you can actually... Pretty much, they changed some of the naming, and it's all Japanese-based names. So it doesn't necessarily. They're three-letter acronyms for Japanese names. Oh, so okay. you have to follow acronym to acronym, and you can see where it maps across. Okay, cool. But um, doing the later Forerunner to the early Sequoia is they're fairly compatible. Right on. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Now he's gonna grab this with his forklift. That's some good forklift driving, yeah, Wes. An expert forklift driving. Sliding the pallet underneath there. This way they can move this out of the shop. look at some stuff that you don't really get a good bird's eye view at. This is your throttle cable going through the firewall over here. These lines, they got a little tweaked when we pulled out the engine because we didn't see that they were connected to some hoses. So as the body came up, these things got bent. Don't know what these go to, but they go... You know what these lines are for? Those are the rear heater lines. That's what those are. So the rear heater lines got tweaked. We might have to replace these. I don't know. See, they got bent because we didn't notice until the body started coming up oh, and yeah, they, they were started bent. They started bending down. Yeah. Notice that the last second, but those are the rear heater lines that got bent. Okay. Those the metal lines, you could just replace them right here. Dude, They're for the transmission. Transmissions. The other, the Sequoia has a column shift. So we oh. have to swap the A340, the adapter, uh, from the two transmissions. Ah, uh, gotcha. And then this is a problem. The fuel, we have to relocate fuel filter out of the way because the exhaust header runs down here. Oh, the exhaust is going to run right yeah. through here? And the other problem is this is the most awkward part of the swap, which as far as I know, nobody has done this on a non-body lifted forerunner. So we're attempting to do it without a body lift. Uh -huh. And most of them do it because they get clearance, clearance on these lines here, and then the steering column comes right down where the back of the header drops. Uh huh. So we might have to get creative there. Oh, re redesign the, the exhaust a little exhaust bit? Exhaust header. However, to be carb legal, you can't touch it. It has to be stock. Ah. Uh, so. <laughs> you have to hide it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see, uh, this is the fuel filter. These are the fuel lines. And you can see different things we had to disconnect here to get the body up off. Back over. for the yeah, EVAP tank. 
the evac tank, yeah. So yeah, we have all these lines that we disconnected here to get the body up off the chassis. This is the evac? Yeah, it's the evac for the charcoal canister. What is this for? It's like excess fuel that comes in, it gets absorbed in that charcoal, I think it gets uh -huh. returned back to the tank. There's an evac, I think there's a pump actually. This is your itself. filler neck connection. You see all these bolts hanging down. These are all the body mount bolts. That's what all those are. We got these two brake lines that had to be disconnected because these were attached to the frame. They basically connected here on the frame. So they had to be disconnected. There's are those fuel lines that I showed you earlier. This is for the parking brake. See these tabs right here? We had to squeeze these in because this is right underneath the center console. So we had to take the center console up and squeeze these in so we could pull this out underneath. And this is what is connected to the actual handle for the e-brake. And so we had to take those two little nuts off and then get that free of the brake lever. So you see here, Wes, before he pulled the transmission transfer case the engine out, he marked the center point of the transfer case shifter. So he ran a straight edge over to where the transfer case shifter was in the center here. And he ran a straight edge back and marked it on the frame. So this is gonna help him line the motor mounts up when he gets the new engine transfer case and transmission lowered into place. And so he put one on the frame here too on the other side. So this is the column shift bracket off the transmission. You can see it goes up here and it's actually a cable that snakes all the way around right here. This okay. is actually would come into the body and actually pulls. Oh, okay through the gears, right? Okay. So we're pulling all this off, and then we're gonna take the one off the four out of the other A340 and put it back on, so we'll have the floor shift instead. Oh, okay, so you're just disconnecting right? the so linkage off the swap. Sequoia, it's swapping the, yep. the linkage, okay. Yep. So this is an A340F, but it has just a different- Apparently a different bell housing. Different bell housing to attach to this motor. So where did you find this motor? This is a uh, 2003 Sequoia that we bought off the Copart. Copart? Copart.com, it's an insurance auction. Okay. This was a State Farm uh, write-off in Fresno that was hit in the back corner of the Sequoia. Hit very hard, although it looks like they were kind of hooning on it. <laughs> There's a lot of dirt. And so the motor transfer case, the rear, it basically got hit up the rear axle. So everything in front of that was good. And so we paid 1100 bucks. 1100 bucks for everything. Transfer case, entire transmission truck. engine. Entire, Tra entire truck. The entire truck. We oh. picked the entire truck up here on a U-Haul and brought it back up to San Jose. Okay. Uh, and then parted it out right out here. Okay. Pulled the motor and everything. So how many miles are on it? This is 160,000 miles. 160,000 miles. Yes. Two UZ. So this is the second gen. The one UZ is found in the, the 90s, 2000s Lexus LS 400s. It's an aluminum block, aluminum head. This is the two UZ found in the trucks, which is iron block, aluminum head. It makes less power, more torque. Apparently. Less power, Toyota. more torque. Yeah, Toyota did them obviously for the trucks. And then they have a 3UZ, which was in the newer stuff. The 3UZ is significantly a higher horsepower and torque motor. Okay. Uh, but it's variable valve. This is a non variable valve timing motor. The uh, 2005 is just standard. It's a quad cam motor though, so it's two cams on each side. And then in the 2006 and newer, these would be variable valve timing. But there's quite a bit more wiring involved and could be a little bit more of a nightmare to get through carb. So okay. I elected to do the earlier motor, even though it's down almost, I think it's almost 50 horsepower. Here. Okay. It's significant. But this is a trail rig and highway traveling. I don't need big horsepower. In this. Okay. Just a little bit of torque for towing. So how much horsepower will this have compared to the old 3.4 so liter V6? the horsepower V6? itself is not that big. I think the old factory was like 180. These are 230, 240. Okay. So for the effort, maybe it doesn't seem <laughs> worth all this. Torque, I think, is where it's really at, though. I think it's quite a bit more torque. A lot more torque. So a lot more torque for towing and stuff like that. Exactly. And okay. so this, well, it's a, what, it's a 3.6 V6 out of there. This is 4.7. Well, well, that's a 3.4. Yeah, 3.4. So you get more than a liter of displacement difference. Cool. So the 2UZ motor didn't come with these heater control connection and these lines right here, this one right here, and this one right here that hooks up to the rear heater because Mikey has a rear heater on his forerunner, so he's gonna disconnect these two lines and they might work, they might not work. Two connections are further apart on the two UZ, so they might still work, but we'll have to see. So he's gonna disconnect these hoses from the, the 3.4 liter V6 and connect them up to the two UZ motor that he's put into his truck.
There we go. We got it. There. There's one. one. It's got a plastic wrap on there, huh? Yeah. That's, I don't want to crush it, but try that. This one. Ooh, this one's right up against this there. This one's in there good. I can move it all. What is attached up here? Yeah, a bracket right there. Little clip there. Interesting little clip. There we go. There you go. Bingo. Didn't hit myself in the face either. Yeah. This is a Pep Boys serviced motor. <laughs> Pep Boy? Uh, the, <laughs> this one wasn't. The V8 was serviced at Pep Boys as far as we can see according to the Carfax. Oh boy. So it's got a bit of sludge in there. We're going to probably run some sea foam through it. <laughs> now they got the TUUZ motor up on the picker. They're doing the technique again of getting the bar. Now we're rolling the chassis back underneath the motor. Those yellow lines are going to help them line it up. We're off on this side. It's all right. We'll have to move it after we build the motor mounts and stuff. Then you, yeah, when you get ready to put the body in. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Now we're going to have to get the pole out underneath there so the transmission will drop in and the engine will drop in. Getting a bracket out of the way that I'm probably not going to need anymore. At least not for now. So this engine was serviced by Pep Boys. Yes. <laughs> All the documentation I can find, it was Pep Boys service. It's got the rear later for the, the uh, driver's side uh, under the bell cover. The line is up front the <laughs> Yeah. But it runs. In fact, the, the spark plugs, I think were probably original with 160,000 miles. They were down to the nubs. The electrode was actually uh. gone. <laughs> it was amazing. It never huh. seen So what did the car fact show? Was it regular services though? It was serviced in Toyota dealer for the first few years, and it was just pet oh, yeah, yeah. every year, few years after that. So, gotcha. There's quite a few Sequoias out there. I'm gonna jock the part. Over. It's hard to find these with the V8 and the, uh, the four by four V8. They're all V8, but finding a four by four one's tough. Not yeah. Bad. So you'll see the four by four pan, the oil pan is set just like the V6, uh -huh. so that it's, it's curved here so it actually fits around the oh. front differential. Perfect. Yeah. Drop it down. Slow it down a bit. Okay, motor is coming down. It needs to go way down. It needs down. to go in. Yeah, it's going to It needs to go to yeah, I only have like three inches. Well, it's going to swing my way when it comes down. Yeah, it's, I'm going to drop it down a bit first then. You could do a lot with three inches, Mikey. <laughs> yeah. Watch out that oil pan. Yep, that's as far as I feel comfortable. So you're taking the motor mounts off? Yeah. The motor mounts off to slide it past. The Sequoia had a pretty, quite a bit of a wider frame. So are you going to have to fabricate custom engine mounts too? Yeah, we're going to make custom engine mounts and I think we're going to cut the transmission cross member and move it back and roll it back on. Okay, so custom cross member, custom mounts. Yeah. If you look at it, you basically had to make the piece fit by making it bigger so it will bolt up to the original motor mount spot. Another thing that was necessary, he has to relocate this cross member number three. Originally, it was right in this area, but because the transmission and transfer case set up with the Sequoia, is a little bit longer he had to move it back about three inches and so now it could bolt up to the transmission mount or be on the right spot so he had to move it back three inches so the transmission mount could bolt up to the cross member so they had to grind it and break the welds and then move it and re-weld it and then they just shot it with some paint so to prevent rusting that's what they had to do for the transmission so custom motor mounts and relocate cross member number three so the transmission can bolt up to the cross member. The other issue is the steering right here. The exhaust gets in the way of the steering shaft, which is right back here. And so I don't know if they figured it out yet, the fix for this, but I'll find out. One guy did this before, had to cut the header and extend it and move it back 
a little bit to give the steering shaft room to come down and meet up with the rag joint on the steering rack so that's another issue all right so we are now looking at an alteration mikey did with the exhaust on the driver's side so the tab here one of the tabs they cut off to make room for the steering shaft the reason why they haven't done another complete alteration is that the smog referees will have a problem with you altering the original exhaust so he has to keep it original for now to get passed by the smog referee for the v8 swap they just cut off this one corner here to make room for the steering shaft and then afterwards they're going to do something a little bit cleaner so it looks better and maybe operates better too because who knows if this might be an area for an exhaust leak he doesn't think so but who knows maybe there's a chance that this could be an exhaust leak because now it's not going to be bolted on this side on this corner of the exhaust manifold for the heater hoses what mikey used is he's using the same heater hose and controller from the forerunner engine and he's put it back on the rig and hooked up the hoses so he had to change some of the lengths of the hoses so he had to buy some aftermarket hoses from o'reilly's this side this one actually did fit and then the the front the the small ones to the rear heater they were slightly too short okay so he had to make some alterations with the uh, length of the heater hoses to go to the rear heater and to the other ones he did keep this from the forerunner so he can make the heater hose connections work yep. i still got rear heat as well he still got rear heat, that's good. Now, the other thing that he did, which is very nice, is he bought a radiator that came from Japan yeah. that is meant for a diesel. And the reason why he needed the diesel one is because the inlet and outlets are in different positions. So on the regular Toyota 4Runner radiator, this one would be the actual one that goes to the upper radiator hose, but now it's on the driver's side. So it's gonna go down here and connect here. And then on the bottom, you'll see that the bottom radiator hose, instead of being on the driver's side, yeah. that one is now on the passenger side. And it's a big, long one that goes all the way up here. And the amazing thing about that is that is the factory Sequoia lower hose. So or actually, this is the factory Sequoia upper hose. And this one's gonna get cut down a bit but the, the lower one is an exact fit from the Sequoia. Very cool, okay. So this air box that he's using for this V8 swap came off of a fourth gen 4Runner and it's a direct bolt on, I guess. Did you have to do uh, So we've cut this, we've cut another. This is where the original intake was off the, the third gen 4Runner. We've moved the and cut back another, I think it was another five inch hole, something like that and offset this and we actually had to push this is 2002 model, so it's got all the extra wiring for the, the VSC and the ABS. So we've pushed all this back. Basically, all these are like one hole back, but we managed to find factory nuts there, put them in. Uh, the other thing is this is just a 2003 and 2004 airbox. So it's got the MAF. They went to a different style of MAF sensor in 2006 when they went to the VVTi motor. So you need to find the 2003, 2004 box. So okay. that will fit the earlier math. Okay, so air box from a fourth gen 4Runner and he had to cut an extra hole and do a few yeah. modifications, but nothing too crazy. Yeah. And then for the power steering, he's actually using the Sequoia pump and Sequoia reservoir, but the lines that coming from the steering rack are the same lines that were on the 4Runner to begin with. So the yeah. power steering lines from the steering rack to the pump on the Sequoia engine. Obviously we can't use the factory style clutch like uh, engine driven fan. So we're gonna use electric fans. We have yet to find ones that fit. We'll update the video when we do. There's an entire box full of different fans there. I'm hoping right now that two 12 inch fans, we're gonna set them kind of offset. Uh, high on the driver's side, low on the passenger side. We're gonna build a custom shroud that will bolt into the factory nut locations on this radiator. Having a shroud is crucial to getting this thing really cool. A fan alone isn't gonna cool what we need. Um, also, this is a pretty big radiator. I've heard from reading the, the forums in the UK, some of these guys with the, the One UZ, the, the Lexus motors, they've been running them with factory. Because over there, these rads are easy to find. They run them with just these radiators and it keeps the motors cool, so. I'm hoping. I mean, California, what, it was 110 degrees the last couple of days. This thing needs good cooling, so I uh, have hopes.
Okay. Uh, yeah. So basically what he just explained is that there's not enough room for a regular fan clutch because it's too close. Yeah, you can see actually right here the, the four nuts where the factory fan would bolt in. Yeah, so there's not enough room for a standard fan clutch that you would see on Toyota engine. So a couple different electric fans, he will find the fit in here with a custom fan shroud. Sounds like it's gonna work out really well. We'll show that later on in the video when he gets it figured out. Another thing while we're talking out here is transmission cooling. So this radiator was for an automatic diesel. So it has the transmission cooler mounts. And then we also pulled the Sequoia factory auxiliary cooler. And they call this something funny in the manual. It's like the transmission air oil cooler or something like this. It took us a bit to realize how it's hooked up. But basically we managed to get it and it's a little hacky right now. We're gonna build some better brackets once we've got it going. But it, it mostly fits here. Just had to slightly bend out the AC line. And so we have basically auxiliary transmission cooling, which I think this is a popular upgrade for the standard forerunners. Yeah. Anyway, right? Yep. A lot of people go to, I have one on my truck too. Yeah. Okay, so let's see, what else can we show that you've done so far? Uh, so the wiring harness is now in. We had to switch the connector. So this is where the alternator, Toyota calls it a generator still, generator signals, plus this is the starter, this black white stripe is to the starter solenoid. So these four here had a different plug on the Sequoia than they did on the Forerunner. So we've actually swapped the Forerunner plug end in here onto this side of the harness. So it plugs in just like factory. And in fact, up top here, this was also in the Sequoia power box. It came off this way, but we managed to wedge, and it almost looks factory, the, the power for the fuse box up top here. Okay. So it looks very factory-ish. Looks good to me. Yeah. So the emission lines, this is for the EVAC, the charcoal canister in the back. The funny thing is on the Sequoia, they were all engine mounted, and on the Forerunner, they were mounted here and so we've done half and half. The carb referee, the bar emissions referee is gonna wanna see all Sequoia stuff. So we've got, and I forget which one's which, but it's called a CCV closed and a CCV open valve. So we have one mounted here where the Sequoia would normally have it and then one we've mounted on the same bracket. And in fact, there's a duplicate, one of, of those over here from the Forerunner. And so we, we had basically duplicate of everything and I've removed the Forerunner and replaced it with just the Sequoia. So all the lines are now connected. The only thing missing is this, this is the fuel return line and the fuel intake. And we still need to run the fuel line. And maybe we could go underneath and just show where the Forerunner fuel line normally would be and why we cannot use it in its standard configuration. So you can see under here, I've added a bunch of DEI floor and tunnel heat shield, and it's basically aluminum with some kind of fiberglass backing, and then it's actually adhesive. And so I've lined the side. Toyota from the factory on the passenger side where the exhaust always runs has factory aluminum heat shields. This works actually a lot better than just the factory stuff. But you can see, normally, if you're familiar with the underside here, this is where the fuel filter would normally sit in a standard forerunner. Fortunately, with fuel filter here, they're pretty tall. They sit to about here. This is also exactly, you can see the exhaust again runs right down here from the driver's side. The catalytic converter was physically contacting the fuel filter, so there was no way that was going to work. So what we've done here is we've removed the fuel filter, and in fact, the fuel inlet line coming from the tank to the motor, and I've gone through and done heat shielding because these are all the EVAP lines still back to the charcoal canister and brake lines. And so what I've done here is actually, this is stuck to the body with the adhesive, and I've actually done factory style with the, the nuts. And then up top is just done with nuts to hold it on. So you can actually pull this off for servicing the lines, the brake lines and the EVAP lines. And so the plan is, this is the fuel inlet from the tank to the motor, we're gonna actually run the line outside the frame rail and somewhere along on the frame rail we'll mount the factory filter along here somewhere and then we'll run the line back up, probably up the frame rail and over to the engine intake. So the line's gonna come right up through here somewhere and then we'll probably have it frame mounted, the filter mounted here somewhere on the frame and the line will continue up, snake up and back in. We have yet to figure out <laughs> where it's snaking up, but then it will run right up the top of the frame rail and up to the motor. Okay, so we're on the driver's side. So he's talking about putting the fuel filter on the outside of the driver's side frame rail and then running it down through there. So we'll capture that later on when he uh, actually installs it. And while we're under here, you can see we have the custom drive shaft made up here. This one was done locally, South Bay Drive Line. 
they uh, actually just made us a new one up. And so it's, I believe, four inches shorter. It came out to like 43 and a half inches or something like that. Uh, it was not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I've read different things on the internet. Some people that have done these swaps have had the factory double carden joints, had the factory one cut down. This particular shop wasn't interested in cutting down the factory. They just didn't feel that it was going to balance properly. And not I'm in a huge rush, but they were able to build one for me, and it was actually next day that was done. There's a couple places online that can do them. Places like Tom Woods, I expect probably five, five hundred bucks. I think this one was six hundred. So you can see we have the passenger side exhaust. There's only one nut holding it on now for mock-up. Actually fits quite nicely. Factory O2 sensor here. And then it comes to this flange. This is still back here, the factory Forerunner 200,000 mile muffler that we've cut. And for now, we're actually going to use it. I want this thing to be, I mean, this is going to be my highway family wagon. So I want it to be quiet and no drone. So we'll start with the factory muffler and see where it goes, but we'll do an adapter here. The plan for the driver's side, though, is interesting because there's virtually no space. The Sequoia is like four or five inches longer than the, the Forerunner. And in fact, where you see the separation is between the gas tank and the motor. These two pieces are like five inches farther apart than they are here. And in fact, in the factory configuration, the exhaust will run and curves right through between the factory fuel tank and the back of the, the transfer case. The Sequoia tank, there's actually a heat shield here because the exhaust comes through it. So our plan instead, since we don't have the room to do that, where I've seen it on the other guys that have done it, they've brought it here and kind of 90 would it up or they brought it around in the back here and brought it through. Either way, it's close. There's a lot of sharp bends and it hangs down. So I'm not super excited about it, but it's kind of a necessary evil of what we have to do here. And we'll try and make it as clean as possible. This is the Forerunner shifter. The Sequoia, remember, was a column shift. And actually, if the earlier one we were actually, I had pulled the other motor out and was putting this one in, I switched this over from the column to the floor mount. And so the floor mount one ended up being, I believe it was a couple inches too long. So you can see that Wes has actually cut this down, shortened it a bit so that it's got the proper angle. Okay, so a custom length transmission shift rod. Yep. Okay. Right here, you can see that is the ADD, the, what is it called? The active- Auto Automatic yeah, differential auto disconnect? Exactly. That's the plug for it, for the front diff. What we found is, though they're both six wire, the Forerunner, of course, had to use a different plug configuration than the Sequoia. Terminals are the same, so I actually had to pull, which is not, not super easy or convenient. I pulled that plug back out here and depinned it and put the Sequoia end on it and then ran it back. So now it plugs in just as if it was full Sequoia. Okay, so we had to do some more wire harness work to get the uh, automatic differential disconnect plug connected up properly. Yep. This is a 2002 model again, so it had a wider computer that was the same physical dimensions as the Sequoia engine computer. So it was basically pull it out, change the brackets, and so this is now a Sequoia computer in here. And you can see these three plugs are coming from the engine harness. So they've come right through the factory firewall location. They've come out and there's actually three more plugs that would go in to the Sequoia piece. And basically, I mean, it's like Toyota. They're all designed fairly similar. You can see three plugs, white, gray, white, big white. You can see in the Forerunner is white, gray, white. Unfortunately, they do not directly plug in. That's where some of the magic of the wiring comes in. And the, the pins are just slightly different configuration. So we have an adapter for that we'll talk about in a bit. But what I wanted to show you while we were down here is these are the remaining two. So there's five plugs into the engine computer. Three come from the engine itself. Two come from the body of the car. And these things will be power, stuff to the instrument panel, the shifter, etc. And so what we've done is this is what makes it not fully plug and play, but I've actually depinned the terminals and I'll just grab one of these. These were the factory two connectors from the Forerunner. I've actually taken them off. You could pop these up and you can depin them. And they're all made by a company called Tyco. And so Tyco makes specific ones for like Toyota and Mazda. They also make generic ones and that's what these two are. So I've actually just pulled all the terminals out and then put them into generic ends. And the reason for this is that this female end, you can only buy these 
as they're called, with header pins, which is designed to be into engine computers. These were not designed with just standard male and female ends. So you could never get a female end without getting it in this whole configuration. So we had two options. One was to take this, and I actually ordered, I found the part for this and ordered this header pin, and we were going to actually Dremel it off, and we were going to solder to the backs of them and resin it, but I was worried off-road that it wasn't going to be a stable connection. This is the other option, is that we have just taken generic ones and depinned it, and then repinned it into these two connectors. You can see I've labeled them with a label maker. These were originally called the E12 in the factory service manual. These are an E12 and an E14. I call them M1 and M2 for Mikey 1 and Mikey 2. And we'll show on the, the other end of the, the adapter harness where these plug into. But you can see basically the inputs that are required. We need two male ends, three male ends here, and then we have the equivalent five female ends. And so that's what the adapter harness does. So here we have kind of the wiring magic for the swap. This is an adapter harness I made up. The plan with this was to try and keep it as plug and play as possible. The two goals we had here, one was to not butcher the truck too much if we did want to put it back. Although we've made some mods right now that are not easily reversible. And the second part is that we wanted to actually have this motor out and fired up before we put it in the truck. We actually built a test stand and actually have run the motor on the test stand with the wiring harness to make sure that everything was good. So it looks a little complicated, but it's actually fairly straightforward. So basically we've got the five male ends and we've got five female ends here. And so you can see these two, E4 and E5, those are what actually is going back into the Sequoia computer. These are going to the forerunner, to the body, the M1 and M2 plugs, which I was showing you earlier where I've de-pinned and made them generic Tyco connectors. These are where the original Sequoia engine harness would go into the computer and now they're going into this instead. And then these are also where the Sequoia engine harness is going into. And so I've got different labels on them. These are the kind of the factory. They're known for the Sequoia's IG1, 2, and 3. And then these are actually in the Forerunner. They're <laughs> the same plugs, but they're II1, II2, and II3. And so, Basically, lots of it's one to the other. It goes from one side to the other, but you can see we've done connectors here. These are actually shrink solder connectors. So you crimp them, and then they heat shrink, and they actually have solder in the middle that flows in. So apparently this actually works better than just a standard solder connector because they are crimped down so they'll hold the wire better. There's a couple extra wires here that will be done in the truck. This is for the fuel pump relay. The Sequoia's actually got a separate relay for the fuel pump and from what I've been reading the Sequoia does something fairly modern for fuel pumps now is it runs at two speeds it's a high and a low speed so when you're idling or when you're you know low throttle it will actually slow the fuel pump down whereas the forerunner runs it at full speed right now just for test firing we're just going to leave it without the relay in it so it'll just run at high speed but the plan is to wire the fuel pump relay in this is again for the the evap system this is a canister close wire, and this will actually be run out through the firewall up to where I was showing earlier, the valve that's on the, the driver's side fender. Uh, another interesting thing here is this is the tack signal. Again, this is a V6 truck. The V8, the, the UZ motors, their tack signal actually emulates a four cylinder. And so just connecting these wires up together, this is one goes to the instrument panel, one comes from the ECU as a tack signal. This won't necessarily work. The tack is gonna be off because it's gonna expect a V6. Um, I have two choices here. I can either find a four-cylinder forerunner tachometer and gauge cluster and swap that part in, or Dakota Digital makes a box that's an adapter, and likely that's what I'm going to do. Again, this is the newer updated forerunner, the last year of third-gen production, so they have a different instrument cluster, and the four-cylinder ones weren't available in this year, so I'm not so sure adapting the earlier tack to the later gauge will be successful. And so that's the main part of this. But you can see there's some wires coming off here. And most of this is brought directly over from the Sequoia. And I've just kind of nicely wire tied it. One is Sequoia is full drive-by wire. So it's a drive-by wire throttle pedal. And so it just nicely plugs in here. So it's pretty easy. I just have to run it over and we're actually going to make a custom bracket to mount this out of the dash. And then a bit of the black magic on these swaps is this is a limited model. So this had an engine immobilizer in it. So the forerunner key, and this is actually the Sequoia key from the Rex Sequoia, both of them have a chip in them. And so the idea here is the chip goes in this ring. This ring will pick up 
the chip's ID in the key when it's inserted. The Forerunner, sadly, has a totally different way of implementing this, but both of them have the same ring. It goes to an amplifier, and then the Sequoia, unique to Toyota, has an immobilizer box. The Forerunner and most of the other Toyotas have this built into the, the ECU. And so the, the thing here is, without this matching up, the starter will crank, but it won't uh, allow the fuel injectors to run. So the, you basically you can't steal the car. It won't inject any fuel. So all of this out of Sequoia right now, this is just straight out of the truck. This is the original Sequoia key. Unfortunately, we only got one key when we picked this truck up at Copart. And this key is a valet key, not a master key, which was a real pain. It was a master key. Before we took the truck apart, we could have actually put this in and put the truck into programming mode and actually programmed a new set of keys. And so the idea is that we'll have a Forerunner physical key cut with the Sequoia chip in it. Unfortunately, without the master, you can't program it that easy. So we have to do something a little bit more drastic and actually send this immobilizer box to somebody where they, it's called virginizing the box. And basically they jumper the chip in here and rewrite the chip in the box itself. And so that has yet to be done. So for test firing for right now, I'm literally gonna keep this in here, duct tape the key in here just to make sure it fires. And then the plan is to get this box virginized and we'll actually have this all properly in with the standard Forerunner key ring. So you won't even know that anything's changed. So that basically the security side of it. And that's another part that makes it a little harder as these cars get newer and you know, you do newer motor swaps, they're doing more anti-theft stuff. And Toyota's kind of into GM is the easiest to get around, Toyota's intermediate. You get into the German cars, it's very hard to get around this stuff. But as you can see, 2002, 2003 era stuff, there's a lot of information on the internet that you can find to, to get around some of this, so. That's the adapter harness. Okay. So the key to these swaps, obviously, is the wiring. And with Toyota, it's actually much easier than some of the other brands in that Toyota has a thing called Toyota Tech Info. And so you can Google this, and it's basically, I think it's run by Toyota and Snap-on, but it's pretty much all their service manuals. It's what the dealerships use. And so you can get monthly subscriptions. I think it's about 75 bucks a month. And so I signed up and what I have here, this is the overall engine wiring diagram out of uh, 2002 Forerunner. So that's out of this truck. And in the back, I have a wiring diagram out of 2003 Sequoia. And I just showing an example page here. This is the engine control module portion of each. And it's sometimes as easy as finding each thing and they're labeled similarly, but you have to figure out kind of what they do um, and just picking one input or output from the ECU and comparing it between one and the other. Each one of these will have a number and a letter. These are the connectors. As you heard earlier, I was talking about the E12 and E14 connector. You can see E12 is D and E14 is E. And so, see E9, 10, and 11. These are the five plugs on the engine computer. And so, the VPA and the VPA2 here, this is for the pedal position sensor in the Forerunner, you can see is on E11 pin 10 and this is actually the wire color as well so gr is gray and l is light blue and so you basically put together a spreadsheet which i will show you a very large spreadsheet that maps everything and so how this spreadsheet is done is these across the top each sheet is a different connector in the sequoia that needs to be in the truck and down the side here is pins the color of the wire in the sequoia then this is the forerunner connector which connector it would be on the forerunner its pin and the color from the Forerunner. And you can see basically it's a mapping from pin one on E4 connector in the Sequoia goes to pin one in the E14 connector in the Forerunner. And it's a black red stripe and then it's a white light blue stripe in the Forerunner. And so basically you build a big spreadsheet to decide how all the wiring needs to go together. And I've color coded this here. Everything in the green are things that didn't need to be changed. Those are just straight across wires. All the blue ones are ones I've actually have connected. And then you can see, as I was referring to earlier, that five, the yellow green stripe is the tachometer um, where I've made some notes on there. But you can see there's an E4 and an E5 connector, similar thing. E5 has 35 pins on it. It's a pretty big one, but you can see lots of them is just empty. And so these are all wired. E6, E7, and E8 are just for my reference. These connectors are the three that came right off the engine harness and they just plug directly into the computer. So they didn't need altering at all. They were just nice plug and play. But for future reference, I've labeled them all with what they do. So if we need to troubleshoot, I'll know that, you know, this pin one red color, that controls the first injector 
on the motor. So those are the engine ones, E4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. IG1, IG2, and IG3 are the big body harnesses. There was one was white. This uh, IG2 is gray and IG3 is a big white, I believe, yeah. And so again, these are, you can see a lot of stuff is from the ADD again, from the four wheel drive. Some stuff will be from the transmission. IG2 is all about the front differential. And then IG3 has stuff like starting signals, park neutral position switch power, different stuff like that. And then finally, I have a few more over here, ED1 was that one I was showing under the hood. This is plugs into the fuse box from the engine. This is, you can see the Toyota calls them the generator, three generator wires, and this is the starter solenoid power. And EC2 was underneath there when we were under the uh, truck. I was showing you how I repinned the differential. This is again, it's pretty straight across, but the wires <laughs> were in a different order. And then finally, this is the immobilizer box spreadsheet. And this is all the different pins from the immo box and what needs to go where. And you can see I've actually not hooked a lot of these up because most of these will be hooked into other wires on the Forerunner itself. So it's not truly plug and play. Having the adapter harness makes it a lot easier, but there's still gonna be probably 10 connections that need to be done under the hood. So Mikey, let me ask you this. <laughs> How much time did you invest in researching just the electrical uh, part of this? Yeah, so the electrical, the electrical part is the big part. Probably February of this year, it's now September. February, I started interest in doing a V8 swap and looked around the forums probably for at least a month, looking at different guys that have done this. March, I believe, is when I actually got the Toyota Tech Info subscription. And March and April was just all my spare time was spent looking in those diagrams, understanding what every wire does. And so maybe 75, 100 hours worth of time probably put into this. I'm sure you could do it in the truck and just do it one. And I've seen some other guys have done this and had it successful, just trying it one to one, one to one, one to one. But um, I wanted something that I knew when we get this to this stage, we can plug it in for the most part and start it. So that's why I put a little bit extra time and hunted down all those connectors, research on the Tyco, the, the company that makes all the connectors, trying to find different parts. The good source for those is mouser.com. You can order, basically you almost get the Toyota part numbers and from that you can get the Tyco part number and then you can order these connectors from Mouser and they will ship you identicals of all the stuff and all the terminals. So it's a lot of work. It's, it's not super easy. But again, I'm happy to publish my spreadsheet for all to see. So if somebody else is attempting this, uh, hopefully this will get them a lot farther along. So what you're trying to say, Mikey, is this is not like going out one afternoon and changing the oil on your truck. No, no. <laughs> I would say this is a moderate to advanced level modification. We've done a few engine swaps. This is not the hardest we've done, but it's definitely not a standard when you think of an old school small block Chev into an old muscle car. This is a lot harder than that. Especially the hardest part for this is making sure that this will pass California emissions keeping everything intact there. These UZ motors apparently only need like five wires to actually have this thing run in the car as a basic. But for me, it's having, you know, the proper fuel pump relay and having all the emissions controls, having it hooked up to the factory dash so that it looks just like a forerunner. The plan here is for the average person to think that this came with a V8 in it from Toyota. So that's where the extra time's gone in this one. So what Mikey's basically saying that this is not an easy job. And so he's done a good job of explaining how involved it is just the electrical part of it. And you've seen the other things where you have to have a fabricator that can move the cross member, make custom motor mounts and other custom stuff. So this is not something that you're just like, oh, okay, one day I'm gonna grab a V8 motor and drop it in, no problem. This takes a lot of research and you'd have to have a good fabricator that can weld to move things in the proper location so it works. There's guys in the forums that have done this in you know their own, their front yards, and I'm impressed. I mean, it's, it's certainly doable there. And even looking at the forums, it makes it look somewhat easy. We had the advantage of having a friend with a shop who's a fabricator, we had a lift that we could put it up on and made it a hundred times easier because we could have this body up and down for fitment, which allowed us, I think, to fit the motor much tighter. Most of the guys that have done this, the motors have been sitting up higher and forwards more. And you can see the difference in this one is we've actually been able to keep the V8, the beauty cover on the top, and that's how snug in it fits. But this is the kind of thing you only get by having access to tools like a lift where you can have it up and down multiple times. 
and be willing to com- not compromise, but take things into your own hands. Like we had to push the firewall back slightly to fit the passenger valve cover clearance in there. We had to move the transmission cross member. And the other thing I would say is definitely before you go out and purchase a donor vehicle to swap into your 4Runner, do the research. It's not just third gen 4Runner to first gen Sequoia, it's very model year specific. I chose an 03 Sequoia that had to be, obviously had to be four wheel drive Sequoia, which is very hard to find, even on Copart. People don't seem to roll them as much, which surprises me. You would think four wheel drive ones, they'd be hooning and flipping them all the time. It took three months for us to find one on Copart that was hit in the right way, so it didn't damage what we needed. And then also being an early third gen forerunner, the, you know, the 96 to 98s versus the 99 to 2002, you're gonna have a lot of differences. And in fact, I don't, I don't think I've seen anybody that's done a 2001 or two forerunner with these motor swaps yet. The earlier trucks, I actually think makes it harder to do because the later forerunners, they were sharing technology with Sequoia at the time. So the push button multi-mode transfer case is the exact same thing as Sequoia. They called it different, but it's the same transfer case. So for this, it's just electrical hookup, you can make it work. Whereas in some of the earlier trucks, there was some more, that with the more manual shift pattern transfer cases, they had to do some more work. The reverse is, these trucks have this weird ABS brake setup, which we had a bit of clearance problems. We've actually bent some brake lines out of the way to make it fit, but so far we've been able to keep it. Whereas I think the earlier trucks is much easier when you have just the normal master cylinder booster to fit these motors in. And again, if you're outside of California, the 2UZ is a great motor, but it's an iron block. You could find the 1UZ, which is, came in the, the early, like the 94 to 2000 Lexus, the LS 400s. These motors are everywhere. The pick and pulls here in San Jose, you see five or six of these Lexuses in every pick and pull. So the 1UZ motors are very plentiful. And so a lot of guys do that swap. I think it makes it a much easier thing to do. But in California, you have to have model year or newer motor into whatever you're swapping it into. So we were stuck with a 2UZ or a 3UZ option. So it limits it. Again, it's lots of internet research. It's just surfing, finding other people that have done it. The T4 forum, definitely a lot of help. This is much bigger in the UK, the 1UZ swaps. There's quite a few guys that have done this, so you could find some info there. And then also in New Zealand, apparently, there's a few guys that have been doing this. So. We'll see, I think as these trucks get older, we're gonna find a lot more of these swaps done, especially with uh, the two and the three UZs. All right, we got Mikey back at the Toyota Time Studios here in San Jose, California, and he's finally done with the job. He's got all the other custom stuff that he needed to do to get his rig running. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Mikey and he's <laughs> gonna describe what he did to finish this job. There's a few things that he did or actually more than a few things. And so he's gonna run through them and describe everything that he did. Okay, so I think last time we left, the motor was in, truck was back together, but and the radiator was in, but we didn't have any actual accessory cooling. So rad hoses are here now. I think last time we had a Sequoia lower hose on it and a custom upper hose. The Sequoia lower hose ended up on our initial run about 80 miles out, shredded itself into the power steering pulley. And so it had to get AAA at home. So this is actually two Sequoia hoses that's extended out now. So it's just slightly longer to fit in there. And so we now have a fan shroud. It was a custom job. It's got two spall. They're not the narrow ones. They're a medium width fan, probably about 2,500, 3,000 CFM. They are running with a controller, which is temporarily in behind the battery here. Uh, this is a Flexolite controller, which is working okay, but I think it could be better. This is called a PWM controller. So it's actually variable speed for the fans. It's got a temperature probe in the rad line so it will kick on and off based on temperature it's got one for the ac so that when the air conditioning compressor is on it'll spin the fans up to 60 percent as well now mikey i don't know if you mentioned it but didn't wes at his shop make a custom yes. so the, custom uh, the shroud fan, is fan custom truck? so we actually order the fans first and i had it laid out on a cardboard template where it would fit in between you can see it's very tight and in fact this is where the original fan would bolt in, the mechanical fan. And so we actually had to position the electric fans above and below it. And it cools quite well. I have yet to have the fan. We were having, we had a 90 degree weather and the fans just kicked on and off at 60%. So I think there's a lot of extra cooling in there. 
just following up on the rest of the electrical work, we've got another factory style fuse box in there. That's containing the fuel pump relay for the Sequoia. Yeah, you just pop it off there. So it's got a, one relay for the Sequoia. It had a different way than the Forerunner. The Forerunner runs the fuel pump at full speed all the time. The Sequoia actually has a resistor right up and behind it here. It's probably still quite hot. That will run the fuel pump at low speed when you're idling or your low speed operation. I have some fuses and stuff for front and rear lockers and things. And so it's all tied up in a nice box there. And then finally the emissions, which wasn't there before. We had all the other lines. This is the last one, which is for, I think it's called the, the VSV close is the the charcoal canister close valve and so while we're under here the other thing we just recently finished it's got the sequoia ac compressor on it and the rest of the system is forerunner and so we had a local shop in san jose here basically take all the sequoia lines and they use the blocks and the aluminum pieces off of that and they made it to custom hose and so there's a couple of custom pieces and it goes right back in to where the forerunner hookup is and so it uses the forerunner condenser it's a fresh dryer and the rest of the Forerunner system. We put a new receiver dryer on. Uh, last time you saw it, it had been sitting open for like two months. Yeah. So we thought there probably was a lot of water in there. Yeah. And there, it was 26 bucks or something like that to throw in there. I'm trying to think what else since last time. The last thing that I think we have to mention is the custom exhaust that Wes had yes. to make. Yes, so. go underneath and kind of look. So what we've done under here is this is actually an adapted system. This is a MagnaFlow kit for a Sequoia. It's an aftermarket performance kit, as they call it. And you can see it's actually ridiculously large diameter tubes. But I wanted a stainless system, and there's pretty few options for something in this custom besides this. The MagnaFlow muffler, and then the MagnaFlow up pipes and then we've had to modify and adapt it to fit the shorter length of the Forerunner versus the Sequoia. And so the passenger side manifold and cat, that exists as it was off the Sequoia. Uh, we can go over the driver's side after, and you can see from last time where we had the chopped ear off the manifold, we've actually got another manifold on there now and um, done quite a bit of tweaking. So we wanted to have a very stock look with this. So we cut the tailpipe right down to where it kind of is like the Forerunner output was. But you can see it's massive and it looked a little ridiculous coming out when it was hanging down lower. <laughs> and so the Magnaflow system would have the muffler plus a resonator on it in the Sequoia application. We didn't have space for a resonator so it's running just with the muffler. And it still sounds pretty good. So on this side, you can see I've wrapped it all with its DEI titanium wrap exhaust wrap, try and keep the heat away from the transfer case as much as possible. So it's actually mostly the stock Sequoia cat downpipe, but we cut off another exhaust manifold coming off the block and rotated the lower half around. So it now clears the steering shaft quite nicely and it comes down perfectly so it comes straight back through the cat. So it's a much cleaner system and it keeps the heat off the fuel evap lines which are hidden up and behind the heat shielding. Like Mikey mentioned, because the exhaust is coming down the driver's side frame rail, they had to relocate the fuel lines. So you can see right here where that red connector is, that's coming from the fuel tank. And then here's the, the driver's side frame rail, and it goes on top of the driver's side frame rail, and then it comes along towards the front of the vehicle, and this is where, the, that's a stock Toyota fuel filter, and then it goes along there and then it travels back actually through the frame it looks like and then where does it go from there mikey it comes back out on the other side and up where the factory routing is it's currently hidden by so all that yeah, uh insulation so back up in here and it runs right back up where the factory the forerunner line was running so the why wasn't there enough room to get it in here you're just thinking it's too close to the fuel filter well, one, one is the catalytic converter to the fuel filter was very close and number two the the filter was actually mounted up in like basically right in the center there where they also, had lots of room for the filter when the truck didn't have an exhaust in the side they put it right in the dead center oh uh, okay so right where the catalytic converter is now that's kind of where the stock location of the fuel filter was yes yeah so basically somewhere somewhere up above the catalytic converter there that's where the stock location of the fuel filter was so that's why they had to reroute the filter to the outside of the driver's side frame rail then back in towards towards here 
to where then it runs to the the normal routing that it takes to the engine. Yes, and all the rest of the fuel lines, the EVAP lines are all still in the original location and they're hidden by the heat shielding. So, well, it'll be like the Timmy the Toolman talk show and you're my <laughs> first guest. So, Mikey, knowing what you know now, what was entailed with this V8 swap, would you do it again? It's tough to call. Um, it's definitely not something uh, I would recommend an average wrench want to do. You, as we've said before, um, you need somebody who has pretty good fabrication skills. Uh, you need a lot of time. It's, it ended up being a lot more money than I expected it to be. I mean, we started with $1,100 Sequoia off Copart. Um, that was kind of the, the minimum investment that's made. I mean, just the exhaust alone, we had to get this MagnaFlow exhaust, which was like $800. The AC lines were 750 bucks to get the lines and recharge. Uh, my buddy Wes at the hot rod shop, they spent on and off two weeks fabbing this exhaust up uh, in their spare time. So it was not easy or cheap. Uh, if I had to do it again, I probably would have started with like a Lexus, an LX470, uh, perhaps a fourth gen 4Runner. Um, but I like the smaller size of the third gen, and that was kind of the, the goal here, was a V8 in the small size body. Um, and it goes well on the highway. I mean, for the most part, it thinks it's a Sequoia, and it just putters around. But it, you can open it up on the highway now and uh, not be in the slow lane anymore. Good. <laughs> you could probably tow a lot, of, a lot more weight with it. And, and so that's the plan. The plan is to tow with it. Um, we have a hot rod that I want to be towing, and so that trailer's... Hot rod with the trailer is probably 6,500, 7,000 pounds which is the max rating for a Sequoia. Um, so it's got Sequoia brakes, Sequoia motor now. Hopefully yeah. it's considered safe. <laughs> now, would you be willing to put a dollar value on what you actually invested in this? I'd make a guess on this, but probably um, time and labor, excluding my own labor, which is all the wiring and things like that. Um, we're in it for probably Probably about ten, twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, and uh, that's not including the purchase of the truck, right? No. Okay. That's that just, just that's the the donor Sequoia, um, the labor uh, for dropping the motor in, uh, some of the exhaust work, uh, like muffler, uh, AC, uh, some of the wiring. Uh, yeah, it's probably probably getting up near twelve twelve grand. Now, yeah. time. How much personal time do you think you put into this? I started this in my mind, this project, in February of this year. It's now end of October. Um, it's November, October. Yeah. It's, it's 10 months on now. Yeah. Um, it was fairly intensive research, uh, just combing through the Toyota, the electrical wiring diagrams, uh, sourcing parts, sourcing the radiator, really understanding how these trucks actually work. Like, just to get the air conditioning, I mean, I spent five hours troubleshooting last week. Troubleshooting the wiring I'd already done just to figure out why the compressor wasn't kicking on. So, I couldn't even estimate an actual hour amount, only to say that it's been 10 months on and off. Uh, and the actual downtime of the truck, when did we start that? That was August, probably? Yeah, August. Yeah, mid, mid August. Uh, and so the truck was down for probably two and a half months. Basically, I, it's been together and driving on and off for three weeks now. So, yeah. So, I don't. I don't know if I could recommend it. <laughs> it's unique. I like hot rods, and okay. so this is the hot rod family hauler. So, so for you out there watching this video, I think what Mikey's trying to tell you is that this is not what you just kind of decide to do when you wake up on a Saturday morning. <laughs> there was a lot. A time invested in just researching how to go about doing it the wiring harness alone all the research he did to, to get all the the wiring pins right so everything works appropriately and he's not getting check engine lights coming on that was a huge time investment and then you know all the fabrication that had to happen at the shop for the the mufflers repositioning the one of the cross members for the transmission yes making custom motor mounts making the custom fan shroud and then all the other things he talked about uh, the dealing with the AC lines and putting in a new fuse box you know and it goes on and on and on but so the wiring after 
after the motor was in and I already had the main harness for the motor, I probably spent another 15 hours just in miscellaneous wiring on and off, making things tidied up um, and putting, you know, shrouding on the wi uh, wire looms and stuff like that. So even just that, uh, you know. So we hope you were entertained by this project. Again, we didn't start this project off as a how-to video like Oh, Timmy the Tool Man's gonna show me step by step how to do a V8 swap. No, that's not what we were trying to accomplish here. We wanted to kind of show you kind of the grand scope of things of what's entailed, uh, how involved it is to do a V8 swap, and give you kind of a, a bird's eye view of the process that Mikey went through to get this done. So, I hope you liked it. I hope you were entertained. Thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and special guest Mikey. We'll be back with more videos. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Take care. Bye-bye.